Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us tonight for this discussion with C Cecile Richards, president of Planned Parenthood Federation of America. I'm Louise Little, I'm the CEO of University Bookstore, and I'm happy to welcome you to another one of our wonderful events. This year, we're celebrating 118 years of book selling here in Seattle. We're very proud of that, but of course we can't do it without all of you. So thank you very much for coming and for supporting independent bookstores. Um, I also want to let you know that this event is just one of many that we do throughout the year. And so I hope you take a look at our website to see more events that we have. One quick housekeeping item. If you parked in our back parking lot, parking is on us tonight. If you got that card from the attendant, you get to take it home as a little keepsake for the evening. <laughs> Don't worry about trying to turn it in. So tonight we're excited to welcome Cecile Richards. Her new book is called Make Trouble, Standing Up, Speaking Out, and Finding the Courage to Lead. It's a memoir, and she has a lot to talk about. In addition to being president of Planned Parenthood Federation of America, she heads the Planned Parenthood Action Fund, whose millions of activists, donors, and supporters work to expand access to sexual health care and to defend rep reproductive rights. She began her career helping garment workers, hotel workers, and nursing home aides fight for better wages and working conditions. A native Texan, she helped elect that state's first Democratic woman governor, Ann Richards, who happens to be her mom. She served as deputy chief of staff to House Democratic leader Nancy Pelosi, and in both 2011 and 2012, she was named one of Time Magazine's 100 Most Influential People in the World. And this evening, as the book says, she's here to make some trouble. She's joined this evening by Seattle's Lindy West, a contributing opinion writer. A contributing opinion writer for the New York Times. She's also the author of the essay collection, Shrill, Notes from a Loud Woman. So ladies and gentlemen, please welcome both Lindy and Cecile. Thank you all so much for coming. Uh, so I'm such, I'm totally honored to get to do this. Hi. Me too. <laughs> Hi, Cecile. Hey, Lindy. How's it going? Great. Awesome. Good to be in Seattle. I know. You're here for like two hours, and then you have to fly away. I know, but the sun's out. I know. So. And someone just said in the green room that there were orcas in Elliott Bay just frolicking today. And I've lived here my entire life, and I have never seen an orca. Um, but they came out to honor you, <laughs> like all of these people. So should we just jump into it? Yeah, sure. All right. Um, I don't know where to start. I have so many. Your book is amazing, by the way. Oh, thank um, you. It's really fortifying in, a, uh, in this moment in time when everything feels kind of scary. And uh, your book is very like, then I did this, and then I did this, and I did the work, and I kept doing it, and you know, it works. You know, doing the work works. Is that a good sound bite? It's not, okay. Um, <laughs> so over the past few years, um, we've seen Planned Parenthood uh, make kind of a transition from 
um, focusing on reproductive rights in general to talking about abortion more specifically and more openly, it seems like. Um, could you talk about that transition and what inspired that pivot and how people have responded to it? Sure. Um, so let's see, I've been at Planned Parenthood 12 years and it's been the most amazing job of my lifetime. Um, anyway, we could talk more about it um, more generally, but uh, one of the things that was really important when we started is, and I know my, my, one of my partners in troublemaking, Chris Charbonneau, is here, and I just want to shout her out for being such a leader. Um, it's, it's been a steady progress for actually us to provide abortion services all across America, and now we do. And that was one of the things that was really important to me in the organization, was that folks like Chris had always been in the, in the front uh, forefront of that, but it wasn't uniform. And so I think that was one thing, is to establish this as a core service that we provide everywhere, uh, including my home state of Texas. Just really super important. Um, but I think the other piece of it is, and there's a lot we can unpack around language, and is it, I think that women uh, or pregnant people who maybe unintended, you know, get, have an unintended pregnancy, they don't necessarily think about uh, abortion as a right. They think about it as healthier that they need, and they need it to be available and affordable, and they need it to be non-stigmatized and non-judgmental. Uh, and so I, we began to try to Im talk about it as just part of the array of healthcare services that Planned Parenthood provides, and I think that's incredibly important. But I also have to say, I feel like I personally learned a lot, and I think our organization has learned a lot from um, Shout Your Abortion and from the reproductive justice community for like being out there. And it is really incredible to see, t to me, now abortion, abortion stories being told in television by Shonda Rhimes, right, you know, the most important showrunner in, in Hollywood, writing them right into stories in, in movies. And uh, that is, to me, I mean, there's other areas I think we can show progress. But beginning to have, the, have our culture talk about abortion openly uh, and honestly has been just extremely important. And so thank you, Lindy, and all the folks who've been at the forefront of that um, thank, for many years. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Um, yeah, I mean, in terms of that sort of struggle between pragmatism and holding these ideological lines, how do you navigate that? Because I, I feel like, so Shout Your Abortion, which was a... Um, destigmatization campaign that I was involved in. Um, it's just, it's still going on. Um, and it's pretty simple, you know, it's this idea that we don't have to, we don't owe it to anyone to keep our lives and our stories a secret. Um, and that is, at least for me, it was a lot, um, a direct reaction to people telling me that I wasn't allowed to talk about my life. Mm -hmm. But I get people saying, we got a lot of pushback from people saying that this is too extreme and this is gonna turn people off and it's cavalier and it's um, insensitive to people who are conflicted about abortion. Um, and I'm just wondering, when something feels like the right thing to do, but other people are telling you that it's bad for the movement or like the optics are bad or um, it's not the pragmatic move. Uh, like for example, I wrote a column in the New York Times and I said that absolutely abortion should be a litmus test for Democrats. I don't know what it would mean to be a Democrat if we didn't stand for the humanity of people with uteruses. So, but I got so much pushback, especially from men on the left. So I'm just curious how you navigate that line between pragmatism, if it is, even is pragmatic to make those choices, and um, you know, doing and saying what you believe. So thank you for what you wrote because I 100% agree, and I actually don't think you can uh, trade away people's basic human rights for political expediency. It just doesn't work, and it's not right, and I think, I think that is a big problem that people think that somehow if you, if you shade where you, where you really, what you really believe, or if you kind of only halfway stand up for people, that somehow then you're gonna be more successful. And frankly, just on the completely pragmatic side, what I've seen in the 12 years I've been at Planned Parenthood, and as you know, um, you know, over these years, we've actually become much more political. I mean, we have built our political program, we've built our, our um, advocacy and our membership because we realized we couldn't keep providing health care and reproductive health care if we didn't have a, the political muscle to back it up. And I have never seen a case in which it was a politically better place for someone to be to be against women's rights. It just is not happening. And 
I, so I think it's a mythology that we have to bust that people somehow are going to be more enthusiastic about you because you don't stand up for women. It's just not true. Yeah, I mean, I also think that it feels like we've seen in terms of the performance of the Democratic Party or the perceptions of the Democratic Party in the last couple of years that mi the middle ground is not inspiring for people, you know? <laughs> like, uh, hedging and being really careful about everyone, like, not to push too hard on anything, that doesn't get people out and get people inspired, at least for me. I, I want to... Well, yeah, yes, you want, you want people yes. who, who, yeah, who, be, who believe in something. And also, I just think, look, and I, I'm sure we'll get into this, but women are shaking the foundation of this country in every possible way, in culture, in politics, in, you know, you, you name it. And so if there were ever a time to think about what's the, both the right thing to do and the politically smart thing to do, it's to stand with them and to show that you have a backbone and that you have a spine. And... I, I mean, I just, it's so exciting to see, um, I mean, for all the political pragmatists out there, we're just defying every, pro every prediction that they had, right? African-American women electing a Democratic senator in Alabama. That is just like, that was not supposed to happen, and that's what happened. Um, seeing, and you know, we were really involved in Virginia, a state that everyone says is like this kind of bellwether state. Well, I mean, the, the newly elected governor of Virginia won with 22 point uh, advantage with women. The first transgender woman was elected to the George to the Virginia Assembly. The first Latinas ever elected to the Virginia Assembly. It's just women are blowing the roof off of it. And so, if I would think even even the most cynical political folks would look around and say, I think there's something going on here. We better pay attention to. Maybe we should pay attention to these women people. <laughs> I don't know. It's cool that they finally caught on to us. Um, so, as a as a white woman in a position of power. Um, especially someone who's run a huge organization. Um, what can you and other white women specifically who are interested in organizing do to foster not just sort of surface diversity, but uh, meaningful diversity in all strata of power? Yeah. So, yeah, I think it's really, really important. And I think it's, I think that's one of the, look, we have to talk the talk and walk the walk. And, um, it's one of the reasons I'm actually, after 12 years of running this unbelievable, or not running it, but actually <laughs> being part of this incredible organization of Planned Parenthood, um, it's one of the reasons and one of the main reasons that I'm stepping aside because I think it's time for me to make room for somebody else to come in, a whole new generation of leadership. Uh, and that's something that, um, as an organizer, I just feel like has always been a part of... Um, it's just part of what I believe. You can't invite people in and, you know, train up a, a bunch of new folks and then not make room for them to take power as well. Um, I also think, though, there are things that we can all do um, short of just stepping aside from our jobs, and that is, you know, I believe in what we've done at Planned Parenthood these last 12 years is invested in a whole new generation of young people. This is the most diverse generation coming up, most progressive. Uh, and they're ready to lead. And so I'm really proud of that. We've grown from 3 million supporters to now more than 11 and a half million. And a ton of those are young people. Uh, and they're not just our patients. They're really, they're really our leaders. Um, and then the other thing I think we gotta do more of, and we've made steps in Planned Parenthood, we can always do more, and that is to partner with organizations that are led by people of color, um, that may be working on reproductive rights, but they may be working on a lot of other issues. And that to me is incredibly important uh, that we support them, we lift them up, um, we fund them, and we do work together in an intentional way. Yeah, thank you. Um, you know, it's not, it's not enough to just step aside and make room if the apparatus behind you that's going to fill that position is maybe a board of all white people or, you know. Absolutely. Um, so, anyway. So, yeah, I mean, I'm really proud of the, the you know, the selection committee for my, for my successor is a majority of people of color, and they're uh, leaders who have been in this organization now for a long time, and I think are, I think it's going to be a, I mean, I, I don't get to pick my successor, and that's probably a good thing, but, uh, well, it is a good thing, um, but, I, but I feel really good about the, the process going forward. Fantastic. Um, I was wondering, you know, a lot of your book, a significant chunk of your book is about labor organizing and union organizing and the labor movement. And I, I wonder, this is just me <laughs> hypothesizing, but I don't feel like people my age have a 
deep understanding of the importance of the labor movement. Um, and I don't know if, um, you know, we've been kind of conditioned to think that the gig economy is normal and to lose some contact with the power of collective. And I was wondering if you could just talk about that in general, about the power and the importance of unions and the labor movement. Right. Well, I mean, I know it's just a bumper sticker that's probably all over Seattle and the North, <laughs> Northwest, but if, if you uh, like the eight-hour day and weekends, thank the labor movement, because that's why we have it in the United States of America. <laughs> and it's, you know, I came up, yes, as a union organizer working with low-wage workers um, in New Orleans and Los Angeles and Texas and uh, many of the same folks who depend on Planned Parenthood for health care. So in many ways, my, my life has sort of made this, I guess, full, full circle. But I think that as, you know, even though as the labor movement has been under assault, which we know it has been in terms of collective bargaining rights, and certainly by this administration, but long, long, this has been, you know, coming a long, long time, I think it's one of the reasons we see this growing disparity in this country. And, um, but I will say, if there is a, an exciting thing, and maybe folks can look at this and imagine, uh, imagine why it's important, look at the teachers that are striking all across the United States of America for, on behalf of public education. Um, and that, and I mean, the, the thing that's so, there's so many inspiring stories, and I'm sure you've been reading them too, is that they're not just striking for themselves and better wages and working conditions for them. They're, they're striking for their, their, their students. There's, you know, and it is crazy that, that you have teachers, professionals, who are ha having to work two jobs just to stay off food stamps in America. That's outrageous. So I think that this is, and of course, three quarters of these teachers are women, and I think they are, as, as we look at organizing in this country and the role that women are playing, they've been inspired by seeing women do other organizing uh, around so many issues. And so I think this is all kind of like rolling up into, into a really potent organizing force. Um, and so I hope we do that work on the, gra the grassroots um, to, uh, for fair wages and working conditions. I also, just on the education front, I hope to God someday we get, someday soon, we get someone to run the Department of Education who actually cares about public schools again. You know, like, yeah. So... Speaking of our current administration, um, yes. we were just talking about this backstage. Um, you know, you had a front row seat for the rise of the Christian coalition and people um, making a deliberate, strategic effort to turn the Republican Party into a religious organization. Um, or, you know, at least, um, you know what I mean? I do, you know, I do know what you mean. And I, I think, <laughs> do, you, do you remember that? I think I, yeah. Um, Sounds vaguely familiar, and um, yeah. And I, I feel like it's so easy when you're caught up in your life and you're moving forward through history to feel like this administration was dropped on our heads out of nowhere and it's this sort of bizarre anomaly. But if you actually go back and, and look at the last 50 years, you can see it right. develop you know, as a tactical maneuver. It's the culmination of things people did on purpose. So I'm just curious if you have um, lessons that you learned from dealing with these people in the 80s and the 90s um, that we could apply to our lives today for people who are feeling despair <laughs> and feeling really powerless in the face of this monstrosity. Is that too strong? Yeah, I think that's fair. I right. think that's a fair assessment. Thanks. Um, and uh, I, and I, I do talk a lot about this because, of course, so, you know, back in the day, after my mom was elected um, governor, which in and of, of itself was somewhat of a miracle, yeah, but it was great, it was amazing, and that was this, I mean, we, again, just to note, note to the files, this was, she was never supposed to get elected, right? She was a progressive uh, uh, Democrat, which right, uh, right off the bat kind of disqualified her in many folks' minds. She was uh, a recovering alcoholic, she was a divorced woman, and she was a feminist. It was just like... This, you know, so, but the thing that's important to me about this, and again, I'm, I'm gonna get to the Christian coalition part, but no one ever said she could win. No poll ever showed she could win. And so I look at all these women running for office now who are like running before they are ready, as we say, and it's so exciting because that's the only way we win, is when you do it even when they say you can't. And that's really how Ann Richards got elected governor um, of the state of Texas. So, but when she got, unelected, and when she lost to George Bush four years later, it was the first, it was the year that the Christian coalition 
really became the driving force in the Republican Party um, in Texas. And of course, that was when the Gingrich Revolution and Democrats were thrown at, and no one ever saw it coming. Uh, so I think that, and I think there are some instructive things about it. First, um, it is not about religion, okay? It's about power. It's about political power. And so don't ever make the mistake of thinking, because it was called the Christian Coalition, it wasn't they weren't trying to get more people to go to church, right? <laughs> they weren't. They were trying to get more folks um, to go vote and to try to expand the electorate. And that's what they did. They didn't need to deliver 51% of the vote. They just needed to deliver 5 or 10% of the vote that put folks over the, over the top. And then, of course, they took over the Republican Party. And we are now seeing the results of that. So one thing is, don't let them have religion. Because there's a lot of religious folks in this country that have nothing to do with the religious right. We're in a church right and now. And here we are. Amen. <laughs> Say amen. Um, so I just think we have to really never fall into that trap. I mean, there was this bumper sticker that used to be all over Austin at the time, which was, you know, um, God, please protect me from your followers. And I think it just was a you know, reflection of where people were at. But the other thing is, I do think one of the instructive things that was really one of the genius parts of Ralph Reed was that figuring out that if you could expand an electorate by 5 to 10%, you could win races all across the country. So you know what? So can we, and that's what we need to do this November. That is absolutely, that's the key. And, and it, it's fun. I'll tell you one thing, because I was just in, I was just back in Texas yesterday, and uh, in, the, in the primaries in Texas, 58% of the pr primary voters were women. That means a lot more women turned out to vote than had voted ever before. And it doesn't just have to be women. It could be progressives of all sorts. But if we can expand the electorate, we can win all kinds of elections. Let's do it. All right, awesome, all right. done. Yeah. Task number one. Yeah. <laughs> um, so one thing that comes through so beautifully in your book um, is how much Texans love Texas. We just can't help ourselves. I know, I know. it's just crazy. <laughs> My, um, my college roommate was from Texas. I lived with her for like, you know, three or four years. And our house was like Texas flag throw blanket, Texas shaped neon sign, Texas, she had like a stolen highway sign. Like it was just like the whole building was Texas. And I would go back to Austin with her and visit her family. And I mean, and I, and I really, growing up here, we have preconceived notions about Texas. And it was a really, I loved getting to know well, I mean, seriously, I'm admitting my prejudice. Um, I was like, I don't feel like I trust Texas. I don't know. But then, you know, going and spending time there with her, and um, she lives in Houston now, and I go visit her all the time, and it's, it's so fun, and it's such a beautiful, vibrant, diverse place. Anyway, what I'm getting to is, I feel like that Texan's love for Texas reminds me now of the way that I feel seeing my country that I love sort of being overrun and exploited by bad people. And I wonder if that is a similar feeling to being a progressive in Texas who loves Texas. And I guess I just want to know if that gave you any perspective on communicating with ideological opponents that you spent your whole life living very closely with. Um, and I guess just how you keep going and doing your work when you feel like you're drowning in a sea of opposition. <laughs> but for something That's a that, lot. <laughs> but like fighting for something that you love. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, no, I do. Well, I mean, look, I, I, grew, up, I grew up in Dallas, Texas, and which was incredibly conservative. And I mean, my parents were against everything in Dallas, everything that was happening. And so every movement that came through town, they were just like, you know, the anti-war movement, the labor movement, the civil rights movement, and then the women's movement came in. My mother just completely lost her mind, and, you know, we never, we just couldn't go back. But, uh, so I guess I, as a Tex, as a progressive Texan, you just grow up knowing you're never going to be in the cool kids club. You're always going to be fighting for something and fighting for the state to be better. So maybe that's just this, you know, this, this sort of the syndrome that we, we live with. And it is amazing to me to see people in Texas never giving up. And, and I, I, one, of the, one of the parts of my book that I write about, and I was just back in Austin with Wendy Davis, the state senator who did the 13-hour filibuster, and um, maybe we are crazy, but even then, I mean, to me, that was such a good example of being in a place. We knew we didn't have the votes. We knew the governor could keep calling special sessions until he jammed through these anti-abortion bills. 
But people didn't care. They just drove hours and stayed, you know, till two and three in the morning to testify against the abortion bills. And then, of course, Wendy did her filibuster, and you could not get another human being into the Capitol. It was completely full. Uh, and, even, and, 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 of course, we won the filibuster that night, even though we knew the governor could come back and do it again. Uh, but something happened that, to me, is that, and it, it gave people the inspiration to know that you could just keep fighting even if the odds were against you, even if no rational person um, would believe that you could ever win. And the reason I'm telling this story and why I try to recount it in the book is because what happened then in Texas is even though they did call a special session, they jammed through bills that closed abortion services all over the state, folks didn't give up. Planned Parenthood kept providing abortion services in the this, in this cities that they could. Um, other folks did as much as they could. Uh, Women started telling their stories, much like Shout Your Abortion. They talked about going to Mexico to get an illegal abortion because they couldn't get one legally in Texas. And folks never quit. And so three years later, as this, this campaign continued on and on, Whole Women's Health, um, the case before the United States Supreme Court, those laws were struck down, okay, by, by three women on the Supreme Court. And that was all the difference. And I just think it's important because if we're fighting for the things we believe in, if it's easy, then we're not fighting hard enough or our, our aspirations aren't big enough. And that to me is what Texans are, are, are about. It's just, and I'll tell you just one little anecdote that is not in the book, I think, at the end. I, I was born in Waco, Texas. I mean, I don't know if you've ever been there, but. I just drove through it, actually. Yeah, well, that's I what mean, most people do. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> just drive through it. Um, you know, home of Baylor University. Well, we just opened, uh, or Planned Parenthood in Texas just opened a state of the art healthcare center in Waco, Texas, and we are providing safe and legal abortion in Waco, Texas. Now, to me, that's when, that's why it's worth it. That's amazing. Um, so you've been an activist essentially since birth. Yeah, I tried um, to be. Yeah. yeah, I'm curious if there was, if there's a moment in your early life when you realized I, I want to do this every day for the rest of my life. Or maybe you haven't decided that. I don't know. No, I have done it. I, what else would I do now, right? I have no skills, so I'm just going to have to continue to be an activist. Um, well, one was one was something I tell early in the book, which is about you know wearing a black armband to Westlake Junior High School in you know outside of Austin and being the only kid and being called to principal's office, and I was terrified because I was such a you know, I was like a straight A student and I'd never even met the principal before, and here he was, Tom Heston. Thank you, Tom Heston, for creating me, you know, kind of getting me on this life of, life of crime that I'm, I've been involved in. Um, but I thought, wow, all it took was me wearing a black armband and the, and the principal wants to call me into his office and, you know, I don't know, read me the riot act. Uh, and so that kind of got me started. But then I think it was being actually going to college and realizing when I was plucked out of Texas and suddenly I'm in Rhode Island and realizing there were so many issues that we needed to be fighting on. And I'll never forget, one of the first ones was um, the effort to divest from South Africa during uh, apartheid. And uh, the same things were being said about us that are being said about kids today. Um, I mean, they were like, you're crazy. We're not going to do that. You know, we're our portfolio, and we can't possibly. And they did. And they did. Because students all across the country insisted and, and protested. And, of course, eventually that was part of uh, the unraveling of the apartheid government in South Africa. And so it was, again, I know you have to, sometimes you, know, you really have to have the long, long view, the arc of justice, as we know. It bends, it, 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 our, our arc of history bends towards justice, but it doesn't get there on its own. But it was amazing um, many, many years later to go back to Brown um, and get an honorary degree the same year they awarded Nelson Mandela an honorary degree, right? And that's where you go, okay, you may not win immediately, but you just have to be in this fight for the rest of your life. And so that's what, that's what got me hooked, I guess. Yeah. Um, what was I gonna say? Oh well, um, I, had a, I was gonna make a joke, but I forgot it, probably for the best. Um, that's okay, there's still time. <laughs> um, so I started crying like four pages into, oh, I know what I was gonna say. It was, it was that anecdote about apartheid where, in your book that was so powerful because it's, you know, I don't remember exactly how you phrase it, but basically, yeah, things that haven't happened yet haven't happened until they do, you know? Right. Like, yeah, it seems like it could never happen, 
But that just is because we have we're not done yet. I don't know. That's exactly just so that's because exactly right. I so I started crying like page four of the introduction because um, because uh, it was I was just reading it and I was like oh my god like we've been working on the same things for so long like these are the same issues for I mean literally generations at this point fighting the same fights. And it's just so exhausting, you know? And I mean, I'm, I'm a writer. I'm not, even, I'm not like a full-time activist. I'm just uh, some lady and I'm exhausted. And I, <laughs> all right? Um, and I just, maybe um, there's no easy answer to this, but how, like, how do you keep, how do you just get the energy to keep going? It's so frustrating when you have to explain the same basic idea for the billionth time. I mean, my God, just like, no, um, no baby parts or whatever, uh, whatever it is. I mean, or even just why is abortion important or why should women be, have jobs or whatever, you know, people <laughs> pretend to not understand. And it's like, I just feel this constant sort of undertow that drags us back into the same conversations and I just wonder how you cope. And you haven't even been before Congress. I you would know. love that. <laughs> You Thank think this God. is bad. <laughs> I mean, I guess I sort of feel like, you know, what's our alternative, right? I mean, if we believe in the things we do is, and honestly, I mean, this is where I also want to just sort of say something about privilege is I, you know, I worked for years, as you mentioned, in the labor movement working with women who, they didn't have any options. They didn't have any choices. If they were, if you're an African-American woman in East Texas, at pretty much the only place you could work was at the nursing home, where you made minimum wage doing back-breaking work. That was your only option. And yet those women, they were like ready to organize and fight back, even if it was just for like 10 cents more an hour and a little bit of respect on the job. So like, how can that not be inspiring? And you know, I could go through the list of the people I met over th those years. And so to me, I feel like my privilege is I've been able to make decisions about what I do with my life and uh, I try to remember that every single day. That, uh, and, and for me, getting to work in a job where you actually get to make a difference in the world is the highest form of privilege there is. And I am so incredibly grateful um, for that. So that, to me, it isn't, it isn't hard, but one thing I guess we have to do as progressives, because I do believe, Molly Ivins used to say, you know, you lose, you lose, you lose, you lose, and then you win, and that was all worth it. And that has been, that is the history of the big struggles, right? Um, and I, I mean, when, when I talk about my book is, you know, the fight for birth control started more than 100 years ago, centuries ago. I mean, 100 years ago, women couldn't even vote. So we've made progress there, right? I mean, here we are. Go yeah, us. we're more voters, you know, <laughs> biggest voting block in the country. Um, but it was amazing, even recently, in the fight over the Affordable Care Act, which was a fight. You would have thought that the fight in the Affordable Care Act was, you know, prescription drug prices or, you know, all kinds of... No, it was abortion and birth control. That was, those were the issues that held it up. And when we finally, after we finally dealt with the abortion issue, then we got to birth control and Congress didn't... They were like, oh, no, 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 wait, we can't do that. Well, we'll have to bring some experts together to talk about birth control so we know what to do. And so they impaneled, they brought this panel together to talk about birth control. And the only thing they had in common is they'd never used birth control because they were all men, right? <laughs> it was just enormously frustrating. So it, it, it was mind blowing. But finally, I mean, you know, after months of fighting and students dressing up in gigantic birth control packs on college campuses, and um, I'll never forget the day that President Obama called me at the Planned Parenthood office. And I just want to say that one more time. President Obama <laughs> called me at the Planned Parenthood office. All okay, right, right. That was worth. That was worth 50 years of, it's of, hard, of struggle. It's hard to even hear his name. I know. I but. know it. Um, but he called to say he was about to announce that from now on, birth control uh, would be covered for all people under insurance at no copay. And now 62 million people in this country are getting it, and we're at the lowest rate of teenage pregnancy in the history of the United States of America. So. I mean, I'm sure Trump's working on it. No, 
actually, you're right. I'm sorry, actually, Lindy said something. Yeah, but she was sure that the president was working on it. But so actually, I get those numbers back up. I Don't worry. Shot. Look, it's crazy. I mean, that's something you say, okay, isn't there something we can all just agree on? Like maybe helping young people get access to birth control and sex education is a good thing. But actually, the Trump administration is now trying to end the teen pregnancy prevention program, and Chris Charbonneau is suing them because it's illegal. So here we go. Obviously, um, to anyone who is paying attention, this is, you know, these things are about systems of power and about disempowering women and um, making women's lives small and, um, you know, keeping them under control. But I, do you have a sense of the ratio? Because there are some people who literally, who, you know, genuinely are like, I'm saving baby angels. You know what I mean? Like, what's the ratio of people who are consciously um, fighting for misogynistic policy to control women versus people who are... I mean, like, growing up in Texas, you must know people who are genuinely anti-abortion because they believe that it's the right thing to be. What do you... I mean, I, I just have trouble reconciling those beliefs and where, how they blend. I don't know. Like, are you asking, are folks conscious that they're trying to put women back? Yes. Yes. I think it's really, no, I mean, it's interesting. Look, there are people, and particularly in Texas, and I learned this through the work we did um, trying to provide an alternative point of view to the Christian coalition, is there are a lot of fundamentalists in Texas for whom the world has to be black and white. And the minute anyone begins to introduce the shade of gray, it's very threatening to them. I mean, and you think about it, if they're, if you're, if your point of view on issues is directly related to your own personal salvation, there's not a lot of room for conversation, right? So I just actually think there are people, that's how they believe, and it isn't it. Then I think there are other folks who have been kind of swept up, and unfortunately we have seen them become violent outside of clinics. These are people who've been swept up by the rhetoric of politicians in Congress saying things about Planned Parenthood, saying things about women and, uh, and women who have abortions. And I think it is incredibly important that we call that out because that is, that is, uh, it is causing damage and harm and sometimes death to people, um, that kind of nasty political rhetoric. And I really think we have to, we do have to make that differentiation. Um, when I sat there before that congressional committee for five plus cool hours, I don't think, I don't think any of those folks were thinking anything other than how can I look good on TV back to the folks at home and prove that I am completely bought and sold by the religious right. That was pretty much, so I don't think it was, I didn't get any sense that they were doing that out of some compassion, some compassion for anyone. Uh, it was really political and that is, I think that's, that is a huge part of what's going on. Yeah, so on that note, is what, <laughs> is the GOP just unsalvageable at this point. Not that I thought there was a, they had a lot going for them before, but I mean, they're just not, there doesn't seem to be anyone who actually believes anything. It's just people who are bought and so. Oh, well, I think, look, I think there are a lot of Republicans who, I mean, there are Republicans who work at Planned Parenthood. They are, sure. they are on our boards, there are patients. And I don't think they think the, that the national dialogue represents their point of view at all. And in fact, we have, you know, uh, and I will say, uh, it is important to remember that in the fight over protecting access to Planned Parenthood and keeping the uh, Obamacare from being repealed, it was two Republican women, Lisa Murkowski and Susan Collins, who actually stood with the Democratic caucus, um, which was completely unified, and they are the reasons why uh, that didn't happen. So I think we have to really acknowledge, that's hard to stand up to the, to the Republican yeah, Senate absolutely. caucus um, and For do sure. that. I guess I just mean, going back to what you said before, you know, this is not about religion. These people, I mean, the degree to which people are caving on their supposed principles to just do whatever Trump wants to do is so frightening. I agree. Um, it, it feels totally, I mean, how do you, how do you fight that if you can't, there's no um, like central point of reasoning. No, I don't think it's about reasoning. I think it is about, look, and I, so I'll just, this is my perspective, um, is that, so we saw the day after the inauguration, the largest marches in the history of the United States of America, right, of women's marches, incredible. I mean, and those were great, 
and but it would have been depressing if that was the end, right? If it was just like we march and we go home and cry and whatever. But what happened is actually then folks just got, they just got angry and got busy. And of course we saw m massive mobilizations at town hall meetings. We saw members of Congress canceling town hall meetings all over the place because they didn't would be met with a bunch of angry women in pink pussy hats. And, uh, <laughs> and then of course people calling Congress, all that. But all of that, um, you know, the marching, the knitting, the, uh, you know, calling, the, uh, the running for office, none of that's gonna matter until we vote. Okay, so voting is the whole thing. And so that is actually, to me, how we change this country, is it's not gonna be by reasoning. This is a political, this is a political fight over the future of not only this country, but the world. And, and it's a fight over whether we believe that, the, that patriarchy, it's time, it's time is gone. And that, to me, is what this November election has to be about, is mobilizing every single person we can to go into the polls and vote. Right. Um, we're about to do audience Q&A, but um, I have your questions here. But there's a truly chilling anecdote in your book about meeting with Jared and Ivanka. I was wondering if you would tell that story for people who haven't heard it yet. And follow-up question, what is Ivanka's deal? And... <laughs> So um, yes, well, to get all the details, you'll probably have to read the book, but yes, I was, um, you know, right after the inauguration, um, I had gotten word that Ivanka wanted to meet about Planned Parenthood, and I was skeptical, and, but I also think I was, this was coming off the heels of the women's marches, and I think that, of course, the president had been out there bragging that they were going to, you know, actually Paul Ryan was bragged that he was you know, there was going to be a bill on the president's desk right beginning of February that was going to defund Planned Parenthood. Of course, I loved it because the minute he said that, you couldn't get a phone call into his office because the lines have been, were so jammed and continue to be. But anyway, so I got this message that she wanted to meet, and even though I was skeptical, I thought, look, if there's anything I can do to kind of explain more to her about what Planned Parenthood does and why it's so critical that our health centers are, stay open across the country, I'll do it. And then I found that she was bringing Jared. So I, I got my husband, Kirk, to go with me. I said, I, there's just like, no way. You don't I, want to be outnumbered. I was like, no way I'm trunks. going there by myself because you'll never find my body. And um, uh, so uh, that's how I found it. We found ourselves driving out to some country club in New Jersey that the president owns. And uh, of course, can you imagine that? What do you wear to a country club in New Jersey? I, I don't know, anyway, there were a lot of things about it that were very, very confusing. Um, so, so we sat there, very, they were very friendly, um, offered us breakfast, I couldn't eat, um, and Jared really kind of drove the meeting, and uh, he, I think he thought that my husband like worked for me, and that we were somehow like a business, like called Planned Parenthood because he kept talking about what a great business we ran. And, uh, um, and it was clear, and I told them, I said, look, I just want you to know what Planned Parenthood does. And the millions of people we serve, one in five women in this country have been to Planned Parenthood. I got it all out there. And he said, yeah, I understand, but look, the Republicans control everything. You have no power. And so, bottom line, you're gonna need to make, we can make a deal, but that, you know, the time's running out. And I said, so, uh, well, I mean, I'm not here, I was really here to talk to you about what we do, why we need to continue to stay open. He said, look, this is what I'm thinking. If you would just quit providing abortions to women in America, I think we could talk to Paul Ryan and secure your funding and maybe even more. And I said, it's I don't a know. Down. I mean, I mean, I mean, basically, and then he said, I would just like a headline that reads, Planned Parenthood discontinues abortion services. Uh, and I said, well, that is not going to happen, and we are never going to trade away women's rights for any money uh, coming from the federal government. It's just not going to happen. So, it was bad. Are they weird? They seem so weird. Sorry, you don't have to gossip. You're no, but one thing, I mean, one thing, too, that... You have that, dignity. Because <laughs> I think this has been said before, and one thing that, the, the one thing that Ivanka said was, she said, well, you know that my father is pro-life. <laughs> and, I mean, I know, it took me a while on that one, and I just said, look, I, whatever, whatever your father believes, um, that's his business, but he, 
I don't really care because it is not his right to take away the right to abortion to every, for every woman in America. That's just not the, you know, so whatever. That's, anyway, I, I, at, at the end of the day, there's a little more de details in the book, but I said, look, I think there's just nothing, this isn't going anywhere. And, and then we went back and fought him and because of a lot of folks in this room and hundreds of thousands of people around America, we beat them back and the doors of Planned Parenthood are still open all across the United States of America. So thank you to all of you for that. Um, all right, a couple audience questions. Uh, this one says, what can women as individuals do to be less afraid and make a difference? That's a really good question. Because actually, I feel like on this book tour, I've been kind of admitting to when people say, like, what do you wish you'd done that you hadn't done? It's like, I wish I hadn't been so afraid. And so I just think we got to say that it's real. It's, um, we have, we live with so much with self-doubt. And again, you know, like there's a lot of Ann Richards truisms in the book, you know, and like lessons. But, because she spent a lot of her life you know, doing what she was supposed to do rather than what she really wanted to do or felt like it was important to do. So I think the important thing is to, um, uh, if you're not scaring yourself, you're probably not doing enough, okay? So just do something that makes you, makes you afraid um, or that takes a risk. As mom would say, uh, what's the worst thing that could happen? I remember, like, I almost, I was afraid to come to the interview at Planned Parenthood, and I write about this. I was like, I don't know how to do that. I've never run anything that big. And, and so I did what every self-respecting grown woman would do. I called my mother and I said, I, I, you know, I, I, she said, are you kidding me? She said, the only thing you ever regret are the things you don't, that you don't try. And what's the worst thing that happened? So I hope that one, you just sort of, we just have to like make that leap of faith. And two, we have to support women in doing everything that they're doing now. And that means if women are running for office, write them a check or go and volunteer for them if you can't write them a check. Um, or run for office yourself, um, uh, or get involved in an organization. I just think, do more than you ever thought you could, because that's what this moment is about, I think. Yeah. So if you're a young person, and you're fired up, and you're passionate, and you want to do something tomorrow, like, what, in a practical level, what should people go do, you know, day one? Well, I think this is the thing, and this is why I wrote the book, because there there isn't one thing you can do that's gonna make it all better. <laughs> that's just, I think we have what? to know. And it's okay, but in a, in a funny way, but it is gonna be somebody doing one thing that's gonna make it all better, and you never know what that is. So it's just more important to find something you're passionate about, and I imagine whoever wrote that question is passionate about something, and then go volunteer, G you know, just go sign up. Um, and maybe go sign up, I was, I was saying to folks earlier, like maybe you've always worked for Planned Parenthood or you've been a clinic escort or something. Okay, go volunteer with an immigration group that's dealing with you know, immigration policy or go work on criminal justice. Expand your horizons because that is the other lasting thing that we have to do as organizers and an activist is get out of our own bubbles and go work on issues that we may have never worked on before. Because when we do, we build, we're gonna build the most powerful movement this country has ever seen. I really do believe that. Absolutely. Yes, applause break. Um, oh, this is such a sweet, sad question. Maybe I'll do it last. No, we'll do it next. No, it's very, it's very sweet. And it's kind of similar to the last one, but a little bit, okay. Uh, it says, do you think we'll ever come to a point where women can relax and exhale in this country knowing our rights are safe? I know. Mm. <laughs> Not, I mean, not really, not really. Yeah. But you have to, but so again, I think part of what I try to write about it in the book is, it has to be, um, being an activist and being, fighting for social justice, look for the ways it can bring you joy, right? Because it's not just about, um, can we ever be relieved? I think it's, it's like finding these people, you know, on the journey that inspire you and that make your life bigger and better, and taking joy in the, in the victories, small ones and, and big ones, that is the way you keep going. And, uh, but if you need to take a break off the field, that's okay, and the rest of us are gonna be there to fill in for you until you're ready to get back on. And I think, look, this last year, there's some folks who are just now kind of getting over the election, and that's okay. We've all been holding the space for them until they're ready to get back in. Uh, I think that's important. 
I was thinking one other thing I could just say, which is, it's a cheap shot, but I just would like to go ahead and get it out there since I'm in Seattle and I'm gonna fly to Portland um, in a minute. Um, when someone said, like, what can you do? Well, one thing you can do is join an organization, support an organization, even if you can't do anything else. And so one of the things that, again, I said earlier, you know, we, about 12 years ago, we were about 3 million supporters. We actually just, I, I just got a text earlier. We, we're now at 12 million supporters in the U.S. And so just to put that in perspective, and then here's the, gonna be the applause line. Um, and that may seem small. So each, that means 12 million different people did something. They signed up or they volunteered or they, um, you know, phone banked. Okay, so now Planned Parenthood is actually more than twice the size of the National Rifle Association, okay? So, and um, it's not that everything's a competition, right? Um, but, but we should it, have a softball game. But just think about that. If all 12 million Planned Parenthood supporters were active in the November elections, we would run the table. Uh, and so I do think that everybody has a, has a role to play. Let's do it. All right, let's go. Let's do it. Um, last question. It's, uh, what are you reading right now? Are you reading any good books? Anything that's inspiring? It um, just says, what are you? It could be Harry Potter. I don't know. <laughs> just says, what are you reading and loving? Right now, sign. Oh. oh, I didn't read the whole thing. Signed, the librarians. Oh, the librarians. <laughs> God love the li librarians. Um, so I've been reading some Ann Patchett because I'm excited. I'm going to read at her bookstore uh, or be at, be with her in her bookstore in Nashville, where she's. Uh, um, I, I just read Lawrence Wright's book about Texas, God Save Texas, but I don't know that it's really inspiring. Um, uh, you don't always have to inspire people. You can take a break. Yeah. Uh, no, and I'm in the middle of, of seeing Unburied Sing, which is unbelievably hard and inspiring, and just, but I have to read it in pieces because it's so much to take in. Um, I read Lindy West. That's what I read, right? Well, thank you so much. Um, those, are that, those are all the questions I have. I think we're at our time limit. Can I, I have one more question on my list, which okay, is... Okay, I want to thank a couple of people before okay. your question. Okay, yeah. I want to thank um, the University Bookstore for doing this and for supporting this and, and Touchstone and Simon and & Schuster. And um, I mentioned Chris Charbonneau from Planned Parenthood here, um, but there's a lot of other folks here from Planned Parenthood. Um, I know Carol Miller's here and other folks. So I want to shout out them, but I also just... There's so many things we didn't talk about, but one of the things that has really changed, um, and it's about abortion stigma and about um, the conversation we started with, um, one of the things I write about in the book was, that was the hardest part of my 12 years at Planned Parenthood was um, the day that Dr. George Tiller was murdered in his church. And so I'm not gonna get into that story now, but uh, George was a really brave man, and um, his motto was trust women. And he, was around, um, he, was, he was public about what he did. And as we know, he um, faced death threats and eventually you know, was murdered. But it was George's, I think, George's leadership and what he did that inspired abortion doctors around the country to begin being public about the work that they do. And that is one thing I've seen that's happened in 12 years is that abortion providers are now lobbying Congress, and they're telling their own stories about the important work that they do. Um, and so I guess I just wanted to take that this moment to thank the abortion providers and clinicians that provide abortion services, not only here but around the country, because they're <laughs> the most amazing people, and they don't get thanked. So thank you. Let's just end on that. Thank you so much. Cecile Richards, everyone. Thank you all for coming. Thank you so thank much. You.